All right, hello everyone. My name is Jarrell Rattler. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about residence halls. And as you can see in the back, that beautiful campus is Alcorn State University in Lorman, Mississippi. All right, so the history of residence halls. Mm -hmm. So early residence halls are modeled after English dormitories. Um, two universities in England that made an example of this were Cambridge and Oxford. All right, so kind of during this time, the United States wanted to pretty much replicate the educational systems that England held. So they also wanted to copy what they did with the residence halls as well. Um, but originally residence halls were originally constructed to accommodate students who traveled long distances from their homes to campus. Um, the history of residence halls continued. So the colonial period, uh, residence halls were designed to bring both students and faculty together intellectually and morally. Uh, professors in England were responsible for instruction while porters and other school officials oversaw the discipline and the supervision of students. Um, however, in the United States, a lack of funding created the situation where professors had to oversee instruction uh, and discipline in contrast to England. So in England, they, were, they had enough money to spread throughout the school to where the professors could focus on teaching and they could have someone that's a little bit lower in the, in the chain of command to uh, have to oversee the discipline and supervision of the students. However, in the United States, it was opposite. The professors had to do both. So that's what kind of presented the concept of in loco parentis, which is Latin for in place of a parent, and that was implemented in the United States. Um, however, further on in the colonial period, financial struggles in the U.S. created more of a dormitory setting for schools. So like a dormitory is pretty much different from a residence hall, as in like a dormitory, the students stay by themselves, um, they eat by themselves, and they aren't interacting with each other or with like a professor or something like that. Um, so like I said, in which students ate and slept separate from faculty, and this wreaked havoc and caused for misbehavior in the residence halls. All right, so moving on to the late 19th century. So the beginning of this period called for university presidents to go away from the importance of residence halls. Um, this was pretty much during wartime, which was like the Civil War. Um, so a lot of university presidents were more concerned with pouring into the research and instruction of their institutions rather than worrying about residence halls. Uh, so at this point, they were kind of worried about constructing academic buildings, constructing buildings for research, different things like that. Uh, so students are responsible for their own housing. Okay, so continuing on to the 20th century. So at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century called for the inclusion of residence halls back into the collegiate experience. So now you see presidents pretty much thought, okay, like it's kind of getting more important to get our students back in residence halls. Let's kind of up the campus life uh, so we can continue to attract more students. Um, so this period is characterized by an influx in college students, uh, mostly minorities and mostly women, and an emphasis on campus life, as I just mentioned. Um, so two things that were huge in helping with this, the, the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works enabled colleges to receive funds through loan and grant programs to construct low-cost housing. So before then, colleges were getting a lot of grants for maybe academic buildings and for research. Um, but there weren't getting many grants for housing, but the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works enabled these schools to do that, to construct low-cost housing. Um, also, the passage of the GI Bill and the Title IV of the Housing Act of 1950 contributed to the greatest expansion of American higher education. So with this influx of students, you had to obviously put them somewhere. Um, so continuing with the 20th century, um, residence halls were built without the idea of creating living learning centers, such as what we see today. Um, so, for example, they had no study rooms, no common areas, different things like that. Um, they were also characterized by strict rules calling stu causing students to uh, question authority. So basically, they were kind of like a dictatorship in there. All right, so an interest in extracurricular activities began as well. So there were literary groups, intramural teams, clubs, etc. Um, a big thing that happened in the 20th century here, the student personal point of view of 1937 and 1949 helped give direction to student affairs and push for student development of the person and mind. 
So this is pretty much this is pretty much the laws that were put in place. Basically, say that like kids going to school aren't supposed to just learn about academics and go about their way. Like college is meant for the development of the entire student, the entire person's mind, um, and the personality as well. Um, the 60s and 70s were the period where the Living Learning Center was introduced, as we see today. And the 80s began the housing and campus life processes we see today, such as freshman enrollees and uh, lottery processes for returning students. All right, so now we're going to talk about the mission and purpose of the residence halls. Um, so residence halls play an integral part in the success of the student and should be constructed to support the academic goals and mission of the institution through the services and programs that they provide. So there's five things that residence halls should provide. It's provide reasonably uh, priced living environments that are clean, attractive, well-maintained, comfortable, and safe. Um, they should ensure the effective administration of the program through sound uh, management. It should provide an environment that promotes learning in its broadest sense, emphasizing academic support, success, and enhancement. Um, provide a variety of nutritious and pleasing meals at a reasonable cost. And they should provide a service that satisfies the need of the housing and food service customer in a courteous, efficient manner. Um, so basically, all this just says like residence hall shouldn't just be somewhere that a student just lays their head and that's it, right? They should aid in their academic success. Um, so a little bit about staffing. Until the 60s, residence hall staffs were, comp were compromised of house mothers, counselors, and advisors. Um, so there are pretty much people working in colleges that weren't very much experienced, but just were experienced as like caretakers and, and taking care of young kids or young adults. Um, they were then replaced by residents, educators with college degrees as schools shifted from in loco parentis to a student institution relationship. Big thing here is that the role of the resident assistant emerged, the role of the RA. So their, ro their roles pretty much include a plethora of things, um, being facilitated of student development, role models, and implementing programs for the entire floor, building, and community. Um, everyone's been in the dorm and got locked out. They got to call their RA. Um, everyone's seen the bulletin boards that you put up uh, every time school is about to start or every time it's a holiday. Um, so we all know that residence, residence assistants are always on call. Um, they're always busy. So their jobs are, are pretty strenuous and pretty tough. Um, while they also have to balance their own social life and schoolwork and different things like that. Um, so RAs are usually supervised by graduate staff or professionals who also started as RAs in undergrads, like a graduate assistant. Um, graduate assistants usually report to, resi to uh, residence hall directors or residence life coordinators. Um, and then both of these positions usually stay in the dorms um, in those communities. And the hall directors report to area coordinators or complex directors. So they will be over the entire thing. So administration and organization. Um, there are six contextual factors that influence the organizational structures of student life. So the institutional size. So pretty much if it's a really big school, there will be a bigger staff. Um, there'll be a complex director. There'll be multiple residence hall directors. There'll be a ton of RAs, a ton of graduate assistants, different things like that. Um, the institutional mission and the role that housing plays at that specific university. Um, so if housing plays a huge role in that, in that institution, um, then they would put a lot more funding towards it. If it's a school that, um, let's say, has a lot of commuters, it wouldn't be as important. Um, so the characteristics of the student body, the grade level of students who reside in residence halls. So a lot of times, like, there will be a lot of freshmen, a lot of sophomores. So a lot of times you have to have programs for them that allow them to get ready to adjust to college and fit the different needs that they have. Um, also, campus policies with respect to mandatory housing and racial and ethnic makeup of the residents. So the future of residence halls, um, it's a tough task for housing and residence life directors to create five to 10 year plans for the residence halls. Um, with an influx of students attending schools online, having financial struggles and decreasing um, decreases in enrollment with some schools, uh, residence life is in danger. Um, so a lot of times 
residents life directors can't think ahead because they don't know if they're going to be budget cuts if they're going to be furloughs if they're going to be different things like that so um, the future of residents life is definitely a danger you can kind of see that here at vsu as well um, as a lot of dorms closed here over the summer because a lot of students aren't coming to classes anymore they're taking classes online and here are my references